We quickly jump over to our next uh, paper. It's joint work from Colombia, Hungary, and New Zealand, uh, presented by Audion. The title is Heavy Hitter Flow Identification in Data Center Networks Using Packet Size Distribution and Template Matching. So please join me in welcoming Audion on stage. Thank you. Um, okay, so uh, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, sweet. Um, so before I start, just a quick clarification. Um, although that now we are associated with different affiliations, uh, this work has been conducted in New Zealand while I've been doing my postdoc. And Alejandra, she's actually here today, but she wasn't confident enough to make a presentation in English. Sorry for saying this. Uh, um, actually, she was doing her master's and studying uh, towards her master's. Uh, in New Zealand. So uh, the majority of the work was, uh, has been done by her, so all the credits goes to her. Okay, so um, yeah, um, within this research, uh, we have been uh, trying to find a novel approach how to identify heavy hitters. Um, uh, heavy hitter flow is basically defined um, as flows uh, that are small in the number that carry the <coughs> majority of the transmitted data. And uh, heavy hitters can be defined in a number of ways. Basically, we try to define them based on the duration, size, weight, and burstiness. And why do we want to actually identify heavy hitter flows? Uh, because they can cause a lot of trouble, for example, in data center networks where they can cause uh, congestion, um, and for this reason, we want to optimize the identification so we can uh, prevent congestion, we can uh, support cost provisioning to services, and uh, for example, we can also achieve close scheduling or load balancing. Okay, so um, how we identify heavy the flows? It is quite simple. We usually use a threshold, whether it is within the burstiness, duration, flow size, or rate, and if the flow exceeds this threshold, it is going to be identified as a heavy hitter. If not, otherwise it is going to be identified as a non-heavy hitter. Uh, this sounds quite easy and simple, but in reality it is not that simple. Because uh, to date, uh, there is no generally accepted uniform threshold for heavy hitter detection. While some paper uses a 10 kilobyte threshold, other papers or works may use one megabyte, 100 kilobytes, and so on, and so on, and so on. This actually causes uh, um, a confusion when you want to do a research in heavy detection, you actually do not really uh, know what kind of threshold you use. Um, and it also looks that in many researches, the researchers just use the threshold which suits the most their research results. Okay, so uh, while one threshold can actually, um, sorry, no, yep, um, oh, this is the one. So while one threshold, uh, a 10 kilobyte threshold, will lead to a different number of heavy hitters, there uh, on the other side, uh, another threshold, let's say 80 kilobytes, may lead to a totally different number of heavy hitters. Um, the accuracy is also quite challenging. Uh, when at any given period of time only part of the flow is known. Because uh, in many cases we cannot wait a while the flow <coughs> is finished completely uh, when deciding or making guesses whether the flow is heavy hitter or not. So if we want to do real time, in time heavy hitter detection, we have to have a certain window uh, which will uh, let us to make a guess with a high confidence. Um, and there is also a um, um, high chance of misclassification. So we used UniV1, uh, this is, uh, uh, these are the authors of the UniV1 dataset, which is a data center dataset. Um, and uh, we actually organized all the packets in the PKFI into flows. And we look at the following situation. By default, uh, this is the distribution of the heavy heater flows and the non-heavy heater flows when we use a 10 kV threshold. When uh, we actually included one more packet of a size of 1,377, uh, uh, 
2,866 non-heavy eaters has been identified as heavy eaters. Only one average packet, uh, only one packet of an average size uh, actually caused this kind of a shift. And then when we actually uh, missed one packet of this size, actually uh, 1,981 uh, heavy heater flows has been, or flows have been identified as non-heavy heaters. So uh, instead of having a threshold, we basically have a range which will define our free groups or free classes. Heavy eaters, ambiguous flow, let's call them ambiguous flows, because we don't have a huge confidence whether they are heavy eaters or non heavy eaters, or at least one packet can cause that they are going to flip to the other side. And then we have a non heavy eater flow. Okay. Um, so, uh, we wanted to take another approach, how to identify, identify heavy eaters. And uh, basically, our approach was that um, in statistical or machine learning based classification, where we try to guess whether the flow is Facebook traffic, Gmail traffic, TCP, UDP, and so on, um, um, uses the following uh, statement or definition that on a flow level, Different applications exhibit various statistical features that make the types of traffic distinguishable. Um, so we try to use this idea and try to look for some statistical features within the flows uh, to find a way how to uh, classify them. And this is how we uh, actually managed to get to the pair flow packet size distribution. We analyzed the packet sizes within the flows. And here we managed to identify three groups of flows where actually based on the packet size distribution uh, we could manage to classify them into the three classes as I uh, introduced here in, in these heavy eaters, ambiguous or misclassification uh, zone and non-heavy eaters. Okay, so basically uh, what we managed to uh, observe here was that uh, in some cases uh, in uh, heavy heaters, let's uh, call them heavy heater flows, ambiguous flows, and non heavy heater flows, that within each of these flow type, there is a certain pattern which actually can be found in all of the flows in terms of that flow packet size distribution. So, uh, this basically uh, accounts to this idea where we have three groups, three classes. And now we wanted to find a way how to use this information or this knowledge to make a classification, to make a confidence guess. So we used that for packet size distribution to identify the heavy eaters. And then we needed to obtain uh, a ground truth. Or at least we wanted to actually uh, achieve to not wait for a way too long time before the flow can be identified. Because what's happening here? It is quite cool that we can say that this is a heavy heater, but what if in within each of the flows I have only five packets? In that case, this is not going to be obvious to me that this is a heavy heater, this might be either of them, and this is a non-heavy heater. So we wanted to find the ground truth and actually uh, the minimum number of something, packet sizes, or number of packets, by which we will manage to get to that state where we can guess with high confidence about the flow type. So for this reason, actually, we made k-means clusterings, again, of the UniV1 data set. And uh, actually, we used silhouette analysis to select the number of clusters. Uh, I'm just going to put this simply. Silhouette analysis uh, actually can tell uh, what is the natural uh, clustering within the data set. So what is the confidence that the clusters can be separated with high confidence? Um, so uh, for the UniV1 uh, data set, actually, we managed to get these scores. And the scores, the closest to one, uh, means the highest uh, confidence, basically. Uh, so we tried a number of clusters, because these are the number of clusters, two, three, four, five, and so on, and so on. But what we have actually realized that um, when we used only two clusters, the two groups 
heavy eaters and non-heavy eaters were actually in balance. We had actually only eight heavy eater flows, and uh, I don't know, it was a huge number, about 300k uh, heavy eater flows and only eight, uh, yeah, no heavy eater flows. 300k non-heavy eater flows and about eight heavy eater flows. So um, this would create uh, a bias when doing a classification. So we wanted to go for another cluster, which would yield uh, a higher uh, confidence to us to make the guesses. So we tried k equals four, and uh, in k equals four, we can say that, uh, well, yeah, I can see here these classes. This is one of the classes, this is the second class. But here, I'm starting to have the feeling that I'm getting to the minimum window, <coughs> uh, which gets me close to the ambiguous flow. But actually, when we look at the numbers between uh, number one, so this is the brown class, and between the four, the blue one, there is still a distinction <coughs> because uh, the minimum uh, of class four actually is higher than the maximum of class one. So uh, as a human, I cannot make a difference because I say, well, this is like a, a layer or something. But if we look at the numbers, clearly there is a distinction. And we are still not getting to the middle range, to the ambiguous flows, where actually I want to do the separation. <coughs> so we have decided now to deep dive into plus one as the next step. And actually, within class one, we made another cluster of uh, silhouette analysis. The silhouette analysis showed us that the highest confidence of the clusters is with k equals two. And then with k equals two, we managed to get to these numbers. Now we are within the second, the middle range, where we have the ambiguous flows. And now within this range, we actually managed to find our minimum something. And the something means the flow size and the number of packets, which will help us to create those windows that when a flow etches these numbers, we can start making the guess based on the packet size distribution. And these numbers are actually, the average, we took the average numbers, so six kilobytes for the uni v1 data set, and then the number of packets were 14. So we used these two features now and threshold to actually separate or create a ground truth within the data set. And this is how we managed to get actually the four regions. So we realized that instead of having three classes, we actually have four classes. And this can actually divide the data set into four parts. Region one, region two, region four, and these are the region of interest which are basically the heavy meter flows. We are interested in these flows. Okay, cool, so basically these are uh, the heavy, the non-heavy eater flows with a high confidence. Region two and three, well, maybe it is not that high of a confidence, and these are heavy eater flows with a high confidence. Okay, so uh, what next? Uh, we wanted to find uh, a way how to actually uh, make use of this information, and basically to start, uh, I'm just checking the time, uh, um, uh, and, and find a way how to actually uh, classify or make the guesses. And if we consider the packet sizes uh, as a continuous random, random variable with different values, in that case, actually, I can find a function which is going to uh, describe me or explain me the distribution of the values within the range. And this function could be actually the, the probability density function, and specifically we used kernel density estimation to get these functions, uh, where the kernel was the Gaussian distribution. Okay, cool, so, uh, and uh, now how to use this information? Well, we have decided to use template matching. Uh, template matching is a, is a well-known, and actually it was proved to be successful in uh, signal processing, and the pattern recognition uh, fields. So we have decided to use this approach, template matching, which assumes that a set of reference stamp patterns are available to us. Uh, and then the task is basically to decide which of the reference patterns a test pattern matches. So uh, this is actually 
when we actually calculate the distance between the two functions. Um, and this is the approach, the architecture of our uh, approach, actually. So uh, the incoming flows, which have uh, never been seen, are basically uh, coming into the density estimation module. Here, uh, the function is calculated. Then we also have a module where actually, by training, we get the templates themselves. So for each region, within those four regions I just uh, introduced, we have a number of uh, density uh, estimation functions. And out of those functions, we actually calculate the template. And the template is going to say, or explain, uh, the template, we calculate that template, which describes the, or characterizes the flows within the region the most. And then we only need to compare the unknown, the new flow, with the template within each region. So, uh, and this is done in the template matching module itself. So we have basically three modules, three and a half, because there is also template adaptation. I will get to this one uh, soon. So these are the master or the principal templates within each region. So as I said, we have a number of flows within each classes because of the ground truth. We have a number of functions in there. And based on the functions, I'm creating a master template which characterizes the flows within each region the most. And then, actually, when a new flow comes, the function is calculated. And by the, uh, the destination uh, regarding each point, the match is calculated. OK, great. So uh, the main problem with this approach right now is that actually um, uh, we need to do a lot of calculation, which is not necessary. And for this reason, we have also decided to do the following. This is an incoming flow. The function is calculated. Then this is actually the template of region 4, as here described. And to prevent the repetitive calculation, we are getting rid of all of those parts within the template which are not necessary. And then, actually, it is just going to compare, calculate the similarity between those points which are necessary to find the match or, or to prove that whether it is a match or not. By this, we could manage to optimize, to improve the performance of the approach itself. OK, so uh, now we are getting to the evaluation part. Uh, within the evaluation, we actually uh, evaluated each of the regions, region 1, 2, 3, 4, and uh, these are the values. As you can see, the TPR is quite good because most of the values are about 90%. FPR also quite small, this is great. The accuracy is also great. Precision, well, this here is a glitch because uh, for region 3, the accuracy is not that great. And then uh, there is F measure. Uh, which actually also proves that the approach can achieve high accuracy. Uh, okay, and we also compare our solution uh, with other work. Uh, and these are the authors of the related work. Uh, any of the authors here, by any chance? Who? Okay. <laughs> okay. So, um, but as you can see, uh, here are all the approaches. These are different uh, approaches how to do the classification. Our approach is here uh, denoted with this color. It cannot really outperform uh, every single time uh, the, the competition. Uh, well, it is weird because uh, there's supposed to be another color for this one, but it, it's not showed up. But uh, that's there somewhere for the projector. I don't know why. Uh, it is just not there. Anyway, so uh, as you can see, uh, although that we didn't outperform uh, the competition every single in every single case, we at least maintained to uh, to hold the same uh, classification accuracy every single time. While actually the competition used different threshold, the uh, performance of the uh, classification dropped or at least changed. And there is also another thing that uh, even the authors admitted that in these two cases, neural networks and OBMM, uh, the class imbalance has a huge impact on, on their results. In our approach, each flow is analyzed uh, in, 
the same packet window, and for this reason, we don't suffer from uh, class imbalances. Okay, so the achieve results. Um, we proposed a novel heavy heat detection approach based on perfect uh, packet size explosion and template matching. We identified four regions, so instead of having only two groups, we now have four regions uh, of, <coughs> of groups composed. Uh, we managed to uh, pursue uh, a classification accuracy of 96% and higher in some cases. And we can apply this approach to, uh, to flow scheduling, post provisioning, and load balancing and whatnot. There was still one more glitch with our approach that when we looked at the times to call it 14 packets before we could make the classification, some flows could take over 500 seconds to get the packets within the flow. But this is from uh, the perspective of real time classification, not, uh, not good. Mm -hmm. We just cannot let the computer to wait for 500 seconds to observe 14 packets. So we have looked one more time at the numbers. And uh, actually, we managed to get to these true positive rates. Within, so these are the packets. So uh, when we waited five packets, or we had only five packets in the flow, and then we made the classification using the template matching approach, we managed to get within each region these accuracies or two positive rates. And these are all the numbers. As we, you can see, as the number of packets increases, the higher confidence or higher accuracy we managed to achieve. And then when we manage to uh, look at the numbers itself, so how long does it take to actually collect those five, six, seven, eight, up to 14 packets, we got the minimum average and maximum numbers. And in some cases, actually we realized that basically <coughs> this one here is uh, regarding some outliers. So it doesn't necessarily mean that uh, our approach is going to fail every single time. If there is an outlier, yes, it is not going to achieve that performance, but in many cases, it is still going to, uh, if we, you look at the average numbers, in many cases, it can make a good guess. With let's say 10 packets, it takes around, in average, uh, three to four seconds to collect uh, 10 packets, and then we can make a guess. Uh, with 10 packets, we will get these these accuracies here over here. So uh, in region three, uh, region uh, two, one, and four will get uh, the true positive rates uh, in such an order. Okay, so um, this was my presentation. Uh, thank you very much for your attention, and if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them, or at least Alejandra can try to answer them if, if she wants. Thank you. for two or three questions. Yes. Thanks, um, I was wondering, you have shown us this performance evaluation results, right? Can you tell us a bit more about the setup and have you done any applications okay. and stuff like this? So how representative are these results? Yeah, okay, yeah. Um, uh, great question. Okay, so, um, well, uh, you probably mean this one and also this one, right? Okay, so I will start with this one. Uh, what we did here, actually, uh, uh, this uh, work is also based on UDV1. So we have the same data set, but they use different approaches. And what we did is that while the outputs used here only a 10K uh, flow size uh, threshold, we also swapped on six kilobyte threshold with 10, then with 100, and 1,000. And then, actually, we used 14 packets because our approach is still based on the 14 packets of uh, limitation when we actually created the template. The templates are created with 14 packets. So then we actually compare what uh, the uh, related work achieved and what our approach can achieve. And this is how we actually managed to get these numbers that we try to set up same conditions for this uh, related work operation and performance achievement. Uh, okay, and within this one, actually what we have done we have processed a number of ways, and uh, uh, we repeatedly processed UNIV1. So here we actually, uh, a few slides back, we managed to get the uh, ground truth. Within the ground truth, we already had uh, the specific flows which belong to the specific regions, region 1, region 2, region 3, region 4. And then we had these master templates over here. So uh, what we did is that we actually then let the ticket file 
run through our architecture, we organize the packets into flows, and then when the flow managed to achieve 14 packets, then uh, the probability density function was calculated, and it was compared to each of these regions one by one. And if there was a match, it was classified as a heavy liter or non heavy liter flow. Or at least within the regions, whether it is a region one flow, region two, region three, and region four flow. And in that case, we managed to get to these actually performance measures within the TPI, PI, and so on and so on. Does this answer your question? Uh, so, level right here is a huge data set, right? And yeah. you use this data set. Um, to do the classification, have you done some, and if you do some classical learning approach, you only take parts of the data set to learn and use the other part to evaluate. Uh, exactly. so that you do not do the relation on the same data set. So, and the yeah, I, uh, sorry, yeah, I, I mean, we didn't do cross validation if you mean this thing. We actually just did the training on uh, a, a part of the, yeah, so yeah, mm -hmm. uh, we had the training set and we had uh, a test set. And the data set was uh, divided in a 70 to 30 percentage. So we trained uh, or created the templates using the 70 percentage of the data set, and the rest, the 30 percent, was used to test and to manage these results. Good. We have room for one or two more questions. Yes. Uh, thank you for your talk. I've got one question regarding the identification of the heavy hitters, yep. especially in this uh, intermediate region. Is there a way for a human to tell which one is a heavy hitter flow or not? Because it seems like the overall definition is pretty loose. So you cannot really distinguish between heavy hitter flows and non heavy hitters in a deterministic way. Is that right? Or that I yes. uh, this is actually, uh, um, yeah, if this wouldn't be a problem still. I would probably just stand here uh, right now. The, there is no uh, specific definition for heavy hitter detection. Like there is a, a loose definition that if the number of flows exceeds a certain threshold, a certain amount, then it should be a non heavy hitter or heavy hitter. But we cannot tell whether the threshold should be 10 kb, 100 kb, and so on and so on. But there is also a more interesting uh, question to ask right now whether do I really need to. Uh, identify flows with a high accuracy. Because if my objective is to unload the router or the switch or the, the device, the forwarding device, I don't really need to care whether I'm going to miss from time to time a heavy hitter flow or not. But if it is about a concrete and high accurate classification, because I need this for accounting, let's say, if you are an internet service provider or something like that, you still need high, highly accurate heavy hitter detection. But how do you have your metric to uh, the true positive detection rate defined if you cannot really know which flow is a heavy hitter? I mean, you need the ground proof for that, and if you can't have that, then... Yes, so what's happening right now, indeed, we use actually an already known data set. Um, and what we can do is that uh, if we measure this data set in a, set, a certain data center, we hope that the conditions are not going to change. So if we manage to get the templates, we, those templates are going to hold for some time. Of course, we need to actually update the templates from time to time, but we already do this in the, uh, in the template generation module. So from time to time, we actually try to update to add the template to the new conditions. But of course, uh, we still need to do a, a pre-testing or like a pre-evaluation so we can start doing the heavy detection. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Yeah. So I encourage the speakers for the last presentation to enter the stage. Meanwhile, we can take one remaining question if there's anyone who wants to ask a question for Arjan. Yes, any hands? Oh, so let's thank Arjan again.